Hello everyone, Rob Guest from Football.London here and welcome to the latest episode of Gold and Guest Talk Tottenham, sponsored by NordVPN. Joining me as ever, it's Alistair Gold. Ali, you well? I am well. How are you? Refreshed after your trip across the world? Yeah, yeah. Good to be back. Uh, good to be speaking about Spurs again. Is it though? Is it really good to be back? I think you'd prefer to be on holiday, let's be honest, <laughs> but have got to come back at some point. So, uh, yeah, uh, we've got a 1-1 draw with West Ham to uh, discuss. And obviously you were at Tottenham, uh, sorry, the London Stadium last night. <laughs> what did you make of the game then? It wasn't a classic. It wasn't a classic. Yeah, Spurs have knackered me out uh, Kind of a late kick, eight fifteen kickoff, which is one of the stupidest fixture times you can get in the evening. Um, don't get home probably till God, what was it? Gone one half one ish um, after the press conference and everything you do after, and then um, Spurs kindly announcing their financial results at eight am this morning, which we'll uh, discuss in this episode as well. Game itself uh, is a really weird game. Was I kind of agree with Postacoglu that, yeah, it was way better than the last away trip, which was to Fulham, which was horrendous and probably the one of the worst games I've seen Spurs play this season. This was a world away from that. It was much better. And I agree with him. I think a lot of the performance was quite mature in the way they played. However, there were some attacking issues that... We didn't think we were going to be the case when they opened the scoring so early in the game with a classic winger-to-winger Postacoglu goal. But, yeah, just as it wore on, there was some, I think, just deficiencies in the way they were playing. There was, don't get me wrong, look, West Ham are very organised. They're a very structured team. Spurs have not won at West Ham in almost half a decade. You know, that Mourinho's first game is the one where Spurs last won away at West Ham. So it's not like... The walkover anyone should have expected, and they're what a seventh in the table. They've got some decent results against good sides this year. It's it's not like it was ever going to be a walkover, but it was definitely too much predictability and safe play for me from Spurs, which Postacoglu put down to the fact that he felt that because West Ham was so dangerous on the break, essentially some of the passing was a little bit, I guess, with that in mind. Um, but on the whole. It's a funny one. It's a point which we will the the week will dictate whether it's a good one or not. You know, if City beat Villa tonight, obviously Villa haven't got Ollie Watkins in their team. If if City win that game at the Etihad, you know, comfortably, let's say, or even just win it, and then Spurs win the Nuno Derby at the weekend. I think Villa have got Brentford at home. If results go for Spurs this week it suddenly feels like a better point than maybe it seemed uh, kind of on the night. But uh, yeah, it's not, I, you know, it's not doom and despair or anything like that at all. Far from it, but it could have been better. Yeah, I know a lot's been made this season of West Ham's up and down form under David Moyes, but they're still in a decent position in the Premier League table. And you look at the team, Jared Bowen, uh, Lucas Pakatar, uh, Mohamed Kudos, as well, uh, Kurt Zuma, they've got some really, really good players mm. in there, and they're always tricky games for Spurs at the London Stadium. So, yeah, I think I think the point was probably fair, having watched it back. Uh, I don't think Spurs did enough to win it, and no. probably the same for West Ham as well. Uh, they had a couple of decent chances just after half time, and Let's be honest, Mikel Antonio should have scored that when he was put through one on one. But whether that would have counted, I don't know because Absolutely. they might have gone back and said, no, that was a foul on James Madison. On also, the, Van uh, der Ven. If you watch it back, Van der Ven is kind of tripped and pulled by Antonio. And I, right. Moyes said afterwards, I think he thought that was the foul it might have got pulled back for. He was weirdly in his press conference watching the tellies behind us, which was showing <laughs> highlights from the match. <laughs> Yeah, and then it was just like that mad minute uh, yeah. at the end of stoppage time with Destiny a Doggy having a good opportunity to score and just not get enough power or, you know, placement on, mm. on the shot. It was quite easy for Lucas Fabianski and then West Ham going up the other end and threatening. So, yeah, I'd say a point is fair. Whether or not it's a good point or not, we'll have to wait and see towards the end of the season. But when you're looking at... Tottenham's upcoming fixtures when they're away at Newcastle, got Arsenal and Man City at home, Liverpool away, 
you're probably looking at West Ham as a game you need to be winning. But let's be honest, if the last time they won at the London Stadium was 2019, Jose's first game, it's is a really, really tough place. And, you know, West Ham are a decent side, let's be honest. Yeah, I think so. They were they were so, they're so structured. I um I have a few West Ham supporting friends who absolutely cannot stand David Moyes. They just will not have it. And and I'm constantly saying, but isn't he like your best ever manager? <laughs> is he like like won you trophies and everything? And I guess it comes down to the fact that he probably doesn't play the football they want them to play. But as a unit and kind of what he's done with that team, and and like you say, you you reeled off the names earlier about the talented player. I mean, kudos. Every night I looked at I mean, kudos to him. He is a superb player. He is so exciting. I, you know, without trying to disrespect West Ham in any way, I would imagine he might go up the ladder a little bit towards another club within a year or two because every time he got the ball, Spurs just didn't really know entirely what to do with him. He it, Most of the time, he would beat two or three people and he would only kind of mess it up because he kept going too long rather than passing the ball. But if someone can kind of train him to, well, you've seen it with some of his goals this season, I think he's going to be a very good player for someone. Um, and Jared Bowen. I've always liked Jared Bowen. I'm still mystified that Spurs didn't go for him back in the day, 2019. Um, <clears throat> signed young Jack Clark instead. I think Jared Bowen is is a player full of confidence. Everything he does, you can see he believes is something is going to come of it. And I think when you've got you know players like that, like you say, Paqueta as well, Mikel Antonio is a handful for any defender. He is just an absolute pain in the backside to deal with. He's all kind of elbows and jutting his body out to shield the ball. Um, you know, he might not be the most clinical finisher in the world, but he certainly is is a, a handful for a defender. So, yeah, you take all that into account. And I think Spurs still looked like the home side. They had the majority of the ball, 68% of possession. I think I've got their passes here. They had 591 passes to West Ham's 238. 13 shots on goal to West Ham's 11. But ultimately, both of them had four on target and both keepers needed to make three saves apiece. So it wasn't really particularly um, split, I guess, in those terms. And that's probably why a point is fair enough. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I go back to what I said originally. I just, on the to- at the top of it all, I just don't think Spurs attacking-wise got away from, while it's a very successful tactic for them, and it's uh, one of the main tenets of the um, Postacoglu way, the get it out wide, hit it low, score a goal, which obviously the first goal came from. I just felt it was it became their go-to thing to try and get around West Ham, whereas maybe a little bit of guile, a little bit of a trying to dribble past someone. Madison was doing the dribbling past someone quite well, but further back up the pitch. I think if he'd had maybe the opportunity to do that closer to the box, but then again, West Ham was so organised. They always had a, seemed to have about six people in the box at least blocking the way. Um, I'd like to know whether there's a, a slight restriction put on shots from the edge of the box for Spurs. There were so few of them. And when you've got like Sonny, Madison, Poro, Kulusevsky came on later, you know those are players who would like to have a pot shot from the edge of the box. I did think it was quite interesting that we just barely saw any I'm trying to think. I remember Porro hit one just inside the box. Benton Kerr hit one just inside the box. Sonny had a curling effort just inside. But in terms of just having to go from the outside of the box, it's so rare. And I wonder whether Postacoglu just drilled into them like, no, first thought, get it out wide, get it back into the box again. Um, but yeah, it didn't quite work in that respect. But uh, definitely a whole heap of a better performance than the one at Craven Cottage, which still gives me nightmares when I think about the amount of times Fulham got through. Um, I think the main disappointment really is going to be for Postacoglu and Spurs, another set piece goal conceded. You know, that's that's an issue for them. It has this season. Yeah. Uh, before we get onto that set piece goal, obviously mm. we'll have to speak about Tottenham's goal. Uh, first of all, after five minutes, Brennan Johnson on the score sheet and Brennan Johnson back in the team after what was a really, really good cameo appearance uh, against Luton where it had a hand in both goals. And Johnson, you know, had a bit of a tricky start to life at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, but since the turn of the year, he's just really, really kicked on. And that's five goals, seven assists now in 
24 Premier League appearances for Tottenham uh, this season, most certainly making his mark. And it was a really, really good team goal as well. Uh, started with a really good turn in midfield from Rodrigo Bentenker to get the team moving forward. That he was involved. It was Destiny Doggy played it into Timo Werner. Uh, who put in a good ball and I don't think enough's probably made of the movement from Brendan Johnson uh, because he comes off the back of Emerson Palm Mary to get in front of him and uh, good finish with his feet. So it's coming at him at some speed, manages to turn his feet in time to turn it home and you're thinking five minutes on the clock, really good start. Spurs could be scoring another couple here, but unfortunately he just didn't turn out like that. Yeah, no, it was a lovely move. Um, yeah, it was a good raid. Kind of a doggy ran up the side, which I didn't actually realise quite how kind of advanced he got. Plays into Bendiker, who does like a couple of step overs, knocks it out to Werner, and Werner hits it low across to uh, to uh, Bentenker. And um, you know, that's another assist for Timo Werner. Again, that that's him kind of further justifying this quite impressive loan spell overall. Postacoglu was talking about him on. Monday night, uh, sorry, Monday night. <laughs> we, we didn't have dinner or anything. Monday afternoon, um, and he was, um, yeah, just saying it's. He feels it's been a really important loan move. It's like really when they needed it, and he's contributing. And there's still so much more to come. He and he did. To be fair, he was right. I was asking about like, is there any thought about playing Kudelski on the left? Because then rather than cutting inside, he could use his left foot to put the balls across the box. And he quite rightly pointed out, you know. Timo Werner's on the left and he's right-footed. But he's putting in all of these balls with his left foot. And it was quite a kind of a pointed remark to, to Kulisewski, I guess, as much as me. Not that I'm sure Kulisewski reads our transcripts and the press conferences. But, you know, it's true. Werner is probably the one who... Uh, no, that's not fair. I was about to say he's, he's the one that gets the most kind of the low, low balls in. But actually, Brennan Johnson is absolutely smashing those. His delivery is so good. And if anything, that was my issue last night, was that, as you say, Brennan Johnson's movement to get into the six-yard box to put the ball away is something he's done quite consistently this season. And I feel like maybe those on the left don't quite kind of have that same idea at the same time when he's on the ball to get in there, because there's so many times he flashes balls across that people don't get to. Sonny will often come like a little bit back, a bit square for the pullback, which is fine. That's diff that's that's you know part, I guess, of one of the options he's got. But that should allow probably Werner to be there at the back post. It was obviously something that Richardson was doing well uh, with Johnson a couple of months back when they were linking up quite frequently. But uh, yeah, it was a good one. It, it was a good goal, absolutely off the training ground. Brennan Johnson, that's his ninth goal involvement in his past thirteen games which is ridiculous when you look at how many he's done goals or assists. Um, it was their first first half goal in seven matches as well for Spurs. It's been a while in the making. Um, and of course, in classic Spurs fashion, it's like, yay! And then nine minutes later, they concede. But um, they had a few chances straight after that. I think um, Poro shot wide. That was the one where Sonny hit the ball at Fabianski as well. He curled it and he saved it. So they, it could have actually just within those nine minutes added to it but um yeah it was a goal that should have been built on because it was a, a nice kind of culmination on everything they would have been working on the training pitches but then they almost forgot how to do that or they forgot to kind of vary it up i guess for the rest of the game yeah i think it must be said johnson and Werner are developing a bit of a good understanding uh yeah. when it comes to putting the balls across the uh, face of the goal, uh, Brendan Johnson was speaking to Spurs play uh, last night uh, af after the 1-1 draw and he said, you know, he is building up a good relationship with Werner and it's only going to get better with time. And they have linked up on a couple of occasions already. Uh, Johnson teamed up Timo Werner for his first Spurs goal against Crystal Palace. Werner would have had another Tottenham goal to his name, you know, against Luton last Saturday, but Issa Kabore put the ball into his yeah. own net. And then it was roles reversed uh, on Tuesday night with Werner teeing up Johnson. He's a really good weapon to have for Spurs, isn't it? Uh, just when you've got your players coming in, ghosting in at the back post and being able to finish it off. And we've seen it time and time again that whether it's Brendan Johnson or whoever else that, they do put some really, really good balls across the face of the goal. 
Yeah, and I think with Johnson in particular, his ceiling is so high. That's the most exciting thing about him. I mean, he, if you look at him and he's got the pace um, to get past his man, I think technique-wise, he's got a lovely technique. The delivery of the balls into the box from him are, are right up there, um, probably among the best, because Poro's dropped off a little bit, I feel like, in his delivery. Um, and I think like Johnson's taken that over a bit. Um, and, yeah, he, he's starting to get an instinct for goal. It's Yeah, he's really, I feel like he's hitting a new level now in the Postacoglu, and he just understands his place in this system, which suits him so well. Uh, he's got, you know, Kudusevsky got a big job in his hands at the moment to get back into the team. Um, and kind of we, we can discuss about how he came on and whether he should have come on and, and, and the kind of all of that. But in terms of Johnson Werner, you know, they're, they're it's, it's, I don't want to say simple kind of roles in the Postacoglu winger system because it's not, but they do have one main simple objective in an attacking sense, and that is get down, get wide get that ball low into the box. And both of those players are really able to do that. So Spurs should be getting far more out of that. Um, it was a tough night for Sonny. I felt like Sonny didn't really get as involved as he would normally want to. Um, West Ham did a good job of kind of blocking off a lot of the things he does best. Like I say, I would have liked to have seen him dig out a few shots on the edge of the box, but there were a couple of occasions where it looked like he wanted to and they just got enough bodies in front of him. Um his 400th appearance as well for the club, which was a shame. It could have been a bit of a better one. But uh, obviously he'd kind of made a bit of history a couple of days earlier with his 160th goal um, for the club, going fifth in the all-time, or clear in fifth above uh, Cliff Jones in the all-time top goal scorers. But yeah, it was not a night for him. It was a night when maybe I would have thought you'd have brought on Richarlison that a little bit earlier. Um, he kind of came on a bit late and wasn't able to make too much of an impact. But uh Maybe if he'd come on a bit early, he could have disrupted them a little bit in the back line. But uh, yeah, it's a shame that that first goal kind of set up a game that never really arrived. Yeah, and then West Ham equalising not that long after. Uh, Kurt Zuma, uh, what looked to be a header initially, it was actually off his back. Uh, but West, West Ham had actually threatened quite a few times prior to that from set pieces. I didn't... Jared Bowen puts in a really, really uh, good ball. And, you know, look at the size of the West Ham team. You've got Mavroponos, yeah. uh, Zuma, Suchek, uh, Mikel Antonio in the box. They're always going to be uh, tough to defend. And, you know, David Moyes always has his team good on set pieces. And I think West Ham are. And, but when you look at Zuma's goal from a Spurs perspective, really not a good one to concede at all just looks a bit too easy uh when he I think it's Basuma who's probably the closest one to him and yeah it just comes off his back and uh goes in but it's, it's just one of these things isn't it with Spurs and the set pieces they are conceding a lot from them this season they are they are they're and especially when you go to a place like West Ham they're a bit like that team in blue that you seem to have an affection for <laughs> That you know set pieces are going to be a key element of their game because they're a big physical side. They're very well organised. And they were, yeah, with Bowen's delivery, they're going to cause a lot of problems. They were doing a little bit like your lot were doing as well, trying to get Antonio on Vicario. I thought you'd him. mentioned that. So I noticed yeah. that. Antonio yeah, but, on Vicario, yeah. Yeah, Sean Dyche and uh, David Moyes <laughs> sharing notes clearly um, ahead of the game. And oh, the, the goal itself was just... It was such a shame because Postacoglu did ex said exactly the kind of thing that he did when I asked him after the Everton game about set pieces. Was he was like, well, actually, that was only one or two moments. I thought we defended really well against set pieces across the game, and I, and I understand that. Yes, if someone chucks in ten, fifteen set pieces into the box and you concede once or twice, technically you've been successful in a lot of those attempts. But can you consider yourself successful if you have conceded one or two? And that's exactly what I kind of felt yesterday. Was that yes. They did deal with it, but if you're going to let one of those go in, you've ultimately failed because that's what you set up to stop and you haven't stopped it. And that goal, oh, I don't know whether it was just zonal marking or what happened, but I watched Zuma. He wandered across from the left-hand post. Nobody picked him up and he just wanders into the middle and kind of just jumped in front of Basuma, who was just like, wow, where's he come from? And he kind of jumps above him, completely messes up his attempt to head the ball and then, yes, in true Spurs 
fashion, hits the back of his uh, what his back, and it just deflects <laughs> straight into the goal. Um, again, great delivery. That's what's going to happen. It doesn't matter kind of what part of your body it's just going to divert in. But I'm, I have no idea how in that scenario one of West Ham's central defenders and their captain is able to wander around the six-yard box completely unnoticed and unmarked. Um, and that is that's the tenth set-piece goal Spurs have conceded this season. Uh, joint seventh highest in the Premier League uh, with Man U and Bournemouth. Um, weirdly, when I was looking at the stats to get that, with Spurs' high line and the amount of times we've seen teams break against them and all that sort of stuff, how many goals do you think they've conceded from those kind of counter-attacking moments? A handful, you'd say, but given you've said it, it's going to be literally like one or something two. like that. Was, two. Two. Two right. all season. And that's the thing, like, you know, when we're at games, we're constantly like, oh, no, they've got through and all this kind of, they're so open, the high line. But they've actually only conceded twice uh, from them, which is, but then I guess another big part of that is Van der Ven. Um, another little stat to chuck at you. Van der Ven has, oh, the Spurs have only lost one game in the Premier League that he has played the full 90 minutes in. Technically, they've only lost two he started in, but obviously it's not really fair to give him the Chelsea game because he came off, you know, so early. So what's the one game he played in, the full 90, and they oh, lost? God. Uh, it was a home game, and it wasn't that long. Wolves. Ago. Correct. Correct. I, I couldn't believe that. When I saw that stat, it shows how important he is. One game they've lost under him all season in the Premier League. That is mad where he's played 90 minutes. Just need to keep him fit. Yeah, yeah. That's and I think, win, win the league, don't you? <laughs> well, pretty fit. much. <laughs> Honestly. But that ties into that uh, two goals conceded from uh, uh, counterattacks because you saw it again last night. He mops up so much behind. And he was um, Antonio's kind of chief tormentor. He just kind of kept getting back, getting in his face. He actually got a silly yellow card in a way for just chucking a ball away with his hand. Because when you're on that, you know, athletics track pitch, you, you throw that ball away. It goes, you know, pretty much goes to Pudding Mill End Station if you do that. You've got to go and get it. And uh, it was probably more obvious than some of the other moments from other players that should have got a yellow. But, uh, yeah, it's 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 those set pieces. There's too many of them. Um, and, you know, last season I was looking it up. They only conceded eight last season. So they're already two ahead of the entirety of last season, which we know was a complete and utter mess. I think they got 10 in the entirety of the season before. So it was actually, they were joint third best record for uh, defensive, defending set pieces last year. Um, so yeah, Mila Yedinak, we know, is the man in charge of the defensive set pieces. So that's obviously an area he's got to improve so they don't kind of, have any more issues. Um, funny enough, at the other end of the pitch, they're doing quite well from the set piece. Because I, I do see sometimes people call for like, get Gianni Vio back. <laughs> and it's like, you have to kind of explain, no, 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 no. He just did attacking set pieces. He doesn't do defensive set pieces. I, I think they kind of got a bit mixed up with that. But actually, even in what Gianni Vio did, do you know Do you know where he is? I completely missed that he'd gone to another club. Watford. Yeah. I absolutely miss that. I mean, I guess there's the Italian kind of connection there and all that with Watford, but I I genuinely completely miss it. He'd gone into the championship with Watford. It has uh, had a lot of clubs in like the championship, though, hasn't it, before? It's true, Brentford, true. I think, Leeds. That's so it's true. not like just top-end clubs. He literally goes everywhere. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people kind of calling for him back and everything. Like I say, I think mainly because they think he did defensive set pieces, which he had nothing to do with. But I looked at those stats as well. 16 goals Spurs scored from Premier League, in the Premier League last season from set pieces. They've already got 10 from from set pieces. And that, we know Ryan Mason is in charge of the attacking set pieces. I wonder if he, like, before Gianni Vio went, where he just kind of, like, nicked one of his books and, like, just put it in the photocopier and <laughs> took a few pages out of it. Because, you know, with eight matches left, that he could get right, he could be up there and close. You know, they score from a few corners and free kicks, and 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 he might even match that figure, which would be actually be quite funny. Um, but yeah, on the whole, from other set pieces, I can't remember two. I think the only other real issue I can remember was Ward Prowse had a free kick from f quite far out that um, Vicario pushed away, 
Mavropanos had a header that he pushed off the line. That was probably their other best moment, I'd say, West Ham. Was that the one when Antonio then had yeah. a bit of an air kick from like yeah, any It was offside yeah. anyway, Antonio, yeah. and that, the flag went up. But uh, yeah, and that was kind of it for Vicaro. There was, like you say, that moment when Antonio went through 1v1 and kind of just hit a weak shot at him. But I think for one of those two fouls beforehand would have had that kind of ruled out anyway. Um, but then likewise, at the other end, I'm trying to think off the top of my head too many saves that Fabianski had to make in the second half, and I can't really think of any. That a doggy chance was so big towards the end. You know, if he just placed that either side of him, I think that might have won it for him in the last minutes or last moments. But um, yeah, other than Johnson flashing the ball across the box a few times and the odd kick Poro had a shot that was saved, but it was quite central. Yeah, they just just didn't do enough in the final third. I have a team really to merit the win. Yeah, I mean Spurs did get into some good positions. It's got oh, to be said. It's, yeah. it's just the final ball, the final delivery. What's just been lacking at times, and you know they're not going to be at the clinical best every game. And yeah, I suppose it is what it is. They come away with a point from a ground they've struggled at in the past. Uh, what did you make of James Madison's performance? Because he's been back, what, about nine or ten games now since his injury and influential figure for Spurs in the first part of the season, but we've not seen him recapture those levels at all so far. No, I thought thought he and Basuma were better than they have been recently. Um, Madison in particular, I felt, like I said, there was a lot of really nice turns around the centre circle that got Spurs away on breaks. I quite like those. But when he got in and around the actual box, I didn't feel he was as decisive as he can be and and made as much of an impact as he can. I know there was a bit of a to-do about him coming off, but I actually did think he looked quite knackered by the time he came off. He was waning in his impact a little bit. So I kind of understood it. My issue, I think, is more with who came on for him. That's my problem. But I mean, I know we're going to have a little bit of chat about that. But yeah, I just, he he's, he's getting there. I think he's starting to get back to the player he was. And this was another night. I think it was quite important for him to play a couple of games in quick succession. I think that helped, started to get some sharpness into him. Um, but yeah, certainly his delivery is not where it was at the start of the season yet. Um, and once they get that back, I think they'll have a, a very good player on their hands. Yeah, just need to get him back to his best really as soon as possible, especially when you're looking at the fixtures coming up, when it's the Arsenal, City, the Liverpool games, uh, because he was such a pivotal player for Spurs in the first part of the season. And since his return, I think it's one goal, two assists so far. He's just not influencing things in the final third as much uh, as he was previously. But I think it's always the same in it when players come back from injury. They're not going to be at those levels they were when they got injured straight away. Uh, it's going to take a bit of time. And as you said, those two games in quick succession will have helped. Probably would have been nicer to see him get a bit more minutes under his belt when he was away on England duty. But that just wasn't to be. Uh, but yeah, I think I agree with you in terms of the substitution. I know Dane Kulaseski, uh you know, is good in the central role when we've seen him there for Spurs. I think that's his probably preferred position, having, you know, started there when he was with Atalanta in, in Italy. Uh, but for me, you know, Giovanni Celso, you must be so frustrated on the sidelines thinking, where on earth am I going to get minutes from? And it's so puzzling when you look at his situation because, you know, he starts for Argentina, the world champions, and, you know, he's a key, key uh, figure in Lionel Scaloni's team. And it's, yeah, I I just don't get it why he's not getting the minutes. I mean, I've not seen the full 90 minutes of the Luton game because I was away, but from what I've read, you know, he made an impact, made a bit of a difference yeah. when he came on for those he final 20, 20 minutes. And you're thinking, well, should get a bit more game time against West Ham. And to come on for the final minute and then four minutes of injury time, it's like that's barely enough time to get up to the speed of the game. And fair play to him. You know, he, he did tee up Destiny a doggy 
for that uh, shot on target. <laughs> I don't know if he meant it uh, <laughs> with, with the touch, but you know he did create that opportunity. And I mean, we saw it late November, early December when he was given a chance in the team in the central role, and you could see what he did. It was absolutely fantastic against Villa and Man City and deservedly got goals to his name in both games. But we've just barely seen him since. And no, he's been injured. Uh, but it's just when you look at his minutes, you just must be thinking, like, what on earth's going through, you know, his head? Because he's surely thinking, I deserve more playing time. And prime example for me is that Fulham game. 3 nil down after an hour and he comes on with, what, two minutes to go? five yeah. minutes to go, whatever it was. You know, he, he deserves a lot more minutes than he's getting, especially when players such as Madison and Kulaseski just aren't at the top of the game at the moment. Yeah, that's absolutely fair. Um, you know, Postacoglu makes a big deal about there not being a pecking order, and it kind of feels like there is. It's like Kulaseski, you know, had a tough day against Luton. He, he really kind of struggled to make an impact. Um, Lacelso came on was pretty bright, played well. He was heavily involved in the chance. I think he set up um, Johnson for the one where I have no idea still how it didn't cross the line. And he, yeah, he, he was. He looked bright and he looked, he just uh, started a couple of games for Argentina, looked sharp. And you kind of think in a game like this, when you're going to take off Madison, it, it was almost like he felt like he needed them an even more creative uh, or attacking player, I guess, in... Um, in Kulusevsky, but Kulusevsky just feels like a little bit out of form at the moment and he's not quite as confident as he normally would be, whereas you've got a player like Lo Celso who's just, he's aggressive, he raises your tempo a little bit, he's willing to take some risks with his final third passes as well. Um, and I do feel for him, because he was promised, I feel, a lot more at the start of this season, and that was why he stuck around. I kind of, it was almost made kind of you know, you're essentially going to be the rotation option with Madison on the left of those three. And it just hasn't been, you know, yeah, the injuries have played their part as well. But still, like you say, that little kind of run of games when he got back-to-back -back goals, scored at City, just looking really good. Um, and you just kind of think last night, yeah, if you'd given him maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes, it could have potentially been a different end to the game because he's got that quality. And he's also the kind of player you probably do want in a derby. He kind of rises to that sort of, uh, how do I put it, um, aggression. Let's say, aggression is the best word we'll use. Um, and, yeah, I didn't really feel like Kulusevsky added much last night. He, They put him initially on the right of a midfield three, and he ended up just kind of wandering out to the right touchline. And it was a bit like, well, no, that's not really where we want you to be. It just became really cluttered with him, Johnson, and Porro at that point. And then he switched to the left-hand side because that was the thing. That made, that meant Saar was on the left of the three for a little a bit. Well, no, not Saar. Oh, it was Saar. Did Saar come on at the same time? I think he did, didn't he? With um, Yeah, with Kulusevsky. Yeah. So, yeah, it was Saar over on the left as well, which didn't really suit him entirely as well. Um, and you just kind of think you could have solved all of those problems by just bringing Kulusevsky on in the left. And that, uh, sorry, uh, Lo Celso on, on the left, and that, that would have solved that. Um, so, yeah, I do feel disappointed for Lo Celso. Um, it doesn't look like he'll get a start anytime soon either because you know Madison's going to keep starting the games. But yeah, he's got to turn to him that little bit earlier in the match just for... I know, he, look, as all managers say, you know, we're not babysitters. We're not kind of here to make players feel good and special and all that. But if you want someone during this period to make a difference, you've also got to make them feel wanted and part of your team. And especially when they can do you a job. And it is a real shame with him um, because I feel like he's been wasted a little bit this season. There's been so many games where I feel he could have made an impact and he hasn't been used. Yeah, a bit of a vicious circle really for him because he needs to show Postacoglu that he needs or he can play these minutes, but he's not been given them. And just having a look at the amount of minutes he's played this season since he came off injured against Burnley, it's the Fulham game. That's the most amount of minutes he's had in the Tottenham shirt since coming off injured against Burnley. I think that was, what, mm. 22 minutes? And for a player of his quality, you know, he's, he's just not good enough, uh, let's be honest. And if he's got one more year left in his contract, surely thinking this summer, he's got to go somewhere else for the sake 
of your career, really. Uh, but if someone can match his wages, that's the other issue, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. We're finding that so many times. There's so many players with a year left in their contract, but nobody's willing to match those wages, especially when they know if they wait out a year, they can get them for uh, them for free. Yeah. Right, we'll move on to Tottenham's financial results uh, very shortly. But before then, uh, Ali, do you want to tell everyone about the benefits of using NordVPN? Yeah, it was really funny. Someone messaged me this week, uh, I can't remember, one of the social media platforms, to inform me that they'd uh, they'd watched American coverage of the spurs Luton game by using their Nord uh, VPN subscription. I don't know where they came from. It may be that they were in America. It may be they were somewhere else in the world. I don't know. But uh, it did kind of make me chuckle that people do get in contact to, to let us know of their success with Nord VPN. Kind of like we're the, the gatekeepers to the world of Nord. Um, you know, it's fair play. If we can help in any way, then uh, that's what we'll try to do because, you know, we have kind of now got, I guess, quite a long relationship with Nord and uh, a lot of people have signed up and, and found it very beneficial. So that's great that we've kind of, uh, like I say, opened the door for people to find that. And, uh, it, you know, we've said it enough times, it goes without saying almost, but we, we, we should <laughs> because it is part of what we kind of we do with them is that it is a, the Nord VPN is the fastest VPN in the world means there's no buffering, there's no lagging, and you can stream your favorite shows from anywhere in the world without your bandwidth throttling. Something I've used many, many times whenever I've had to travel the world covering Spurs. Um, don't want to kind of get caught short out there without being able to catch whatever you need to or access whatever you need to. So Nord's always allowed me to do that, whether it's switching my device to thinking it's back home in the UK or switching it to think it's in any other country in the world. And Sometimes that can be, you know, certain places uh, block uh, certain uh, just very normal sites, not iffy sites, like certain normal sites in some countries. Like I remember going to um, oh Shanghai for Spurs tour and just certain normal things that you can access in our part of the world. You can't in China and you had to kind of use a VPN to kind of just access your normal things. And, and But even obviously much closer to home as well, it's such a beneficial thing and and not only that but the outline of nordvpn subscription is cheaper for you in the long run and that's because you can purchase streaming services or bookings from other countries at a much cheaper rate so for example you might want to book a flight you know as a man yourself who goes on so many holidays uh, you can you know book a flight from your destination country rather than from the country you're actually traveling from uh, so it can mean that while you're paying out for nord you're actually saving money overall um, there's a whole host of other benefits from signing up to NordVPN, so why not give it a go? To get the best, dis- best discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest. There's no risk with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee, and you'll help support our podcast because of our partnership with them. The link, if you just missed it from me saying it, it's in the episode description box. Right then, financial results for the year ending June the 30th, 2023. Uh, you've had quite an interesting morning uh, oh, looking at yes. all these financial <laughs> results and going through all the pages. Uh, go on then. Let, let's have your thoughts on you know the key, the salient points from the financial results. Well, that's the thing. The key salient points, they always... You know, whenever you open them, Spurs, there's two different ways of looking at it. Spurs will do their very much, here are the highlights, and you get a Daniel Levy chairman statement thing. You know, one of the couple of occasions a year we get to hear his words. But then also, once you've done that, you can, they don't immediately tell you where it is to find it. You have to kind of go either to company's house, which I don't think it's actually on yet, or it wasn't when we started this podcast. Um or via the club website and into, I think it's investors relations. It's all buried within there. You can find the full 60 something page report. And that's often where you'll find the bits and pieces that Spurs maybe don't want to advertise to the world. And, you know, and, and, and you kind of realize like Daniel Levy's salary, Daniel Levy's bonus, um, other little bits and pieces about like transfers and things like that. So, Yes. Yeah, they did wake me up very early this morning with this um, the latest set of figures, which we've been waiting for for a little while. I think I did 
um, hypothesized in a previous podcast that they might wait until after a win of some sort. Um, I don't think they could get it online straight after the Luton game because it was a bank holiday. I think that kind of foiled their plans. If that were their, if that was their plans, I don't know where they were. But um, yeah, it ends up kind of going in the aftermath of a of a draw at West Ham that was a bit like meh. Um, so yeah, key points to take away. I mean, if we're just looking at the figures alone, it's clear that the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium now is just this cash-generating machine of a stadium, as we all expected it to be. And for the first time, Spurs have announced a more than half a billion pound turnover. 54.9... Sorry, 54... I can't speak. 549.6 million pounds in revenue coming into the club. That is just ridiculous that's up 24 percent from the previous year 444 million that was so we should stress that this is the financial results up to the end of june last year so 2022 to 2023 and so you've got a stadium that you know the club have admitted themselves is raking in six million pound a match in revenue and that's just football that's not taken into account you know, the food and drink that you sell at an NFL game over three, four hours when you can sit and have a beer in your seat for the whole game and food and things like that. So that's, yeah, five, almost £550 million pounds pouring into the club this season. That includes match uh, gate receipts of £117.6 million, which is up from £106.1 million the previous year. The club stated that match receipts are a critical revenue stream for the security of the stadium debt. I guess they're trying to uh, also make a point towards the season ticket price increases, which we shall talk about in a little bit. Um, the commercial revenues jumped up big time as well. Um, that included that includes like sponsorship, merchandising, third party events, visitor staff, attractions like the, the Skywalk, all of these sort of things, conferences, events, and also uh, for the first time after COVID, that summer they had the tour to South Korea. So that we suddenly had this lucrative tour in there as well. So that jumped up to two hundred and twenty-seven point seven million pound in commercial revenue. Uh, that's gone up from one hundred eighty-three point five the previous season. Uh, UA for prize money obviously went up as well, fifty-six point two million. That went up from ten point two million, which shows you the massive difference between being in the Conference League to being in the Champions League, which obviously they had uh, last year. But we're going to now see the flip side of that. You would have thought in the next year's one because there's no European football at all this year. Um, however, all of that kind of, yay, look how much money we've got in, has got to be tempered by the fact that the club made a loss. And a, a not insignificant one either, £86.8 million. Pounds. Um, and that is because... Um, Oh, sorry, this is really techie, not techie, but accountancy sounding. But I'm gonna. it's easier to explain exactly as they've written it. That's because the club had a profit from operations before depreciation, amortization, player trading, interest and taxation of £138.7 million, which had gone up from 1123 the previous year. However, once you took all of those things off of that, it became a loss of £86.8 million uh, from £50.1 million the previous year. And the club said that, that figure reflected the significant and continued investment in the playing squad. Um, a little further down, they'd written somewhere um, that since... I haven't got it to hand, but it was since 2019, they claim that they've uh, paid £600 million towards... Um, signing players for the men's and women's team that's what that's what they claim um and what was probably again big headline point of all of this was that they finally admitted publicly that um i'm going to get the exact quote for you daniel levy in his statement said the board and its advisors rothschild and co are in discussions with prospective investors because Spurs need to continue to invest in the teams and undertake future capital projects, so the club requires a significant increase in its equity base. So yeah, the word coming out of Spurs seems to be that that means selling a stake to investor rather than a like a buyout or a takeover or anything like that. But it can't it be a good thing, can't it really? If you can get a cash injection into the club, especially a club that's already in quite a strong financial position, it, surely they can compete against the top uh, teams, can't they? Yeah, very much. Uh, you'd think so. I think 
surely that'd be similar to the Manchester United uh, yeah. thing, wouldn't it? With Sir Jim Ratcliffe uh, having a stake in the club uh, from the Glazers. And, you know, Tottenham are in a decent position at the moment, but need to, you know, kick on a bit more. And obviously a bit more money uh, would help. So if you can get someone who wants to invest in the club, you know, take them forward, then, you know, go for it. But it's just all about, you know, finding the right person uh, because there might be some people who want all of the club rather than, you know, a certain percentage. But, yeah, it's just a case of finding uh, the right person. But Tottenham as a package, when you look at them, the stadium, training ground, uh, just everything in general, it's such an attractive proposition for people who want to, uh, you know, invest in the football club. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, uh, I guess the other side of that, though, is getting the right price. And that, yeah. I think, has always been an issue at Spurs and, and getting the uh, the valuation in the realms of where people will want to invest. Um, and, yeah, also intriguing to see kind of what slice of the pie they're willing to give away and, and, and how much control Daniel Levy, I guess, is willing to give up as part of that as well, because that, that's a huge side to it. Um, I should also say that people worrying about the FFP stuff um, because Spurs, I think, over the last three years, their losses technically do run to 232 million. Apparently, people far more intelligent than me tell me that that's because the annual depreciation charge of 72 million for the stadium is not something that's included in the Premier League profit and sustainability rules. Um, yeah, so some big chunk of it each year is actually stadium related, so that's not included. Um, so they're apparently, yeah, they're nowhere near breaching the limits. You know, not going to be one of those clubs that's getting points taken off or anything for their uh, financial uh, misdemeanors. Um, yeah, Spurs, their statement in Daniel Levy's thing, it says about being, remains fully compliant with the Premier League profit and sustainability rules and is supportive of the enhancement of PSR to continue the Premier League and ensure the, the Premier League remains competitive and sustainable. Um, so, yeah. Other thing, there's a bit of an issue um, in terms of timing for uh, Daniel Levy is when you go into the minutiae of the report, um, you find, uh, which, yeah, strangely, they don't uh, flag up on their main page of highlights, <laughs> which is not surprising, um, is that his pay is on there. As the highest paid director of the club, you have to kind of um, say what, what his pay is and also any bonuses. So, the report showed that Daniel Levy was paid £3.581 million last year, which is up from £3.265 million the previous 12 months. Although that is actually, he, he got a bigger pay rise in last year's report. Last year's report showed that from the previous 12 months, he got about half a million pound extra. Whereas this time, it's you know it's a measly, um, whatever it is, 300,000 or so. Um, but I think that probably the bit that, got a few people's head turned was the fact that he also received in their words an accrued bonus of three million pounds paid across the year so that was the first time that daniel levy got a bonus since 2019 uh, on upon the completion of the tottenham hotspur stadium back then actually he got three million pounds on top of he seemed to have a higher salary back then of four million um i don't know what what caused his wage to drop um unless that was was it chopped with COVID? I was trying to remember. I do remember Maybe. the directors taking a cut. Maybe it remained there. That would make sense, actually. Um, so back then, his bonus was met by loads of disgruntlement because it came... You know, this is the issue with finding it out a year on from when you actually got it, is that a year after that was just around the same time they furloughed people and put you know reversed that decision. So suddenly the big boss man was getting a three million pound bonus as people were being furloughed and it didn't look great. And shock horror, here we are half a decade or so on. And again, his bonus comes at the time when Spurs have announced a 6% rise in uh, season ticket prices. Um, and yes, so in the week that we find out that Daniel Levy's uh, bonus is three million pounds for the past year, or was a year ago anyway, um, the revenue estimates for the increase uh, that Spurs will get from the season ticket price bump is between two and a half million to three million pounds. <laughs> and it's, oh no, <laughs> you can just imagine them thinking, no, why did we pick that percentage? Um, so look, of course, you know, they're not connected. As as kind of like 
I guess people like enjoy going, oh, you know, look what he's done. They're paying for his kind of pay right or bonus or whatever. It, the time scale isn't there. You know, it was like a year ago, kind of essentially he got that bonus. Uh, however, um, I think the tickets you have to kind of, uh, sorry, this, the question you have to ask about the season ticket thing is maybe more so away from his bonus. It's more the fact that, um, you know, is a stadium that generates so much money and they're showing how much they can just get through sponsorship. Do you really need to hit the supporters in the pocket when clearly there's so many other ways of, of raising two and a half to three million pounds just with a bit of kind of smarter, um, yeah, commercial work, sponsorship work or whatever. Um, and I think when, then when it comes to Levy and the bonus, I guess the questions maybe people are more likely going to ask is, you know, if you've had a year at the club where, let's be honest, it was absolute chaos last season. You know, nobody knew what was happening with the club. Football was terrible. Four different managers in charge of the team within the space of about four months. No European football. First time we've had no European football in whatever it was. Like, was it 16, 19 years? I can't remember the exact number now. And not to mention that, you know, the record show the club made an £86.8 million loss. I'm not entirely sure that many people would understand why at the end of a year like that, the man at the very top gets a £3 million bonus. Um, you know, that it's not for me to decide. And there may be other factors, certain things he had to trigger. Maybe it was a certain amount of revenue. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure what it is. But from a kind of um, the view from the outside, it doesn't look great. I guess what someone in that position might argue is, Look, someone like Daniel Levy would make so much more in a different industry or private sector, or whatever. You know, when you're coming out of football clubs, you know, you know, he's going to earn far more in another avenue in just the business world than he would of whatever it was, three and a half million or so, and, and three million in bonus. I get that, but you know, he, he's chosen football. He's been in it for twenty five, or not, not quite, but almost twenty five years. Um, you're going to be under scrutiny. You're going to get a, a slightly smaller pay packet. And yes, I know <laughs> we're talking relative terms, slightly smaller. Um, but I mean, oh, I'll ask you that, you know, do you think it kind of makes much sense? Someone getting a three million pound bonus after a year that looked like that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, that's if you can earn three million for what that year was for Tottenham, like you said, four different managers, team didn't even qualify for Europe it was just a complete mess really when you you look back on it uh you're probably just thinking well what happens if Tottenham have a really successful season you know what's the bonus going to be like then if they're winning trophies they're in the Champions League uh no I don't think it's particularly good luck uh really but you know I suppose it is what it is, uh, really. But I think a lot of supporters are probably just going to say, well, three million bonus. Now you're going to be getting that in terms of the season ticket prices because of the increase. Uh, yeah, not the best of looks. And like you said, that's why it's probably buried in the financial report rather than right at the top on the Spurs' website. Yeah, I mean... You know, I've said it a million times. Spurs are often a bit of a walking PR disaster. They are. They just, it's not always of their own making. Sometimes it is just timing. It's unfortunate. But yeah, they just manage to make decisions and then have something else emerge that makes the decision look even dafter than it did in the first place. Um, and like I say, you know, Daniel Levy's bonus may f- well be from far other, uh, many other factors i'm sure it must be because otherwise you wouldn't just kind of willy-nilly just hand out three million pounds like well thanks for turning up kind of thing especially and people might say you know it's not to do with him what happens on the pitch but it kind of is because he's making the decisions that put these people in charge um and it's interesting uh, they also and I, I knew they would do this as well that they kind of as almost to show like what we've spent since this report it was look at it had one of those little paragraphs as well so they spoke about it i think it was only the summer transfers after the end of june um and that included harry kane obviously going to bayern munich it include mickey van der ven brennan johnson coming in poro and kudasevsky being made permanent their loan moves um so in that period alone which pretty much was July and August, I suppose, and a little tiny, a couple of days, was it one day in September? 
uh, it resulted in a net expenditure of 108.893 million pounds. So that's one of those where a lot of people just say, but they just spent the Harry Kane money. And that kind of shows they didn't, I guess. Uh, if you, you know, you've got to, if we're going to kind of counterbalance, you know, moaning about the uh, the bonus and things like that, I guess you've also got to say that if you're taking the Harry Kane move out of that, which whatever it was, 90, 100 along those lines, seems to always be some disparity over the exact figure he went for, which I guess we won't know maybe until next year. Maybe we'll see that in the financial report then. But yeah, to have a net expenditure of 108.893 million on signings, that suggests that, yeah, there was a, there's got to have been at least well over 200 million spent there. I'm trying to work that out now in my head, how that even works out. I wonder whether the Kane deal was less up front than everyone expected it was. Maybe that's another thing. I mean, you got Van der Ven was what, f- in the 40s, wasn't it? Um, yeah, f- was it? Forty-six, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Brennan Johnson forty-seven point five. Um, so you're already looking up towards kind of that's about ninety over there, 90, just over ninety. Yeah, ninety there. Poran Kulusevski. There's kind of, I think they were around. I think we worked out it was about seventy seventy-five million for the two, wasn't it? Something like that. Seventy all in, I think. So you're looking at one hundred and sixty. Yeah, I guess you're already one hundred and sixty million then. Then. And then that's Manor Solomon was free. Ashley Phillips was only a what two Couple three million. million. Yeah. yeah. Um Valise was about ten, twelve, wasn't it? It wasn't a yeah, lot. Yeah, twelve twelve or thirteen, I think, something um, like that. Uh does else? Dragashin count? No. Just, no. no, it it didn't seem to include Dragashin or right. Timo Werner. Um so who um, else went out though? There was a few loan moves included, so maybe they got loan fees for certain players as well. Um, but yeah, so yeah, at some point we'll, I'm sure we'll sit down and properly work out exactly how that all works out rather than trying to figure it out live on the air. Um, but yeah, so that's what they say. Um, and then they kind of finished off with this little statement where he said, uh, Daniel Levy, our ethos is clear to be far sighted and run the club sustainably. This involves strict control of our cost base increased commercial and sponsorship revenues and consistent European participation, all of which are key to our ability to continue to invest in the squad and win top honours. I'm guessing continue didn't apply to win top honours. (laughs) I'm guessing that's a separate little bit. Uh, Since opening the stadium in April 2019, we've invested over £600 million in our men's and women's first team squads. So, yeah, I mean, I'm intrigued to see how it all kind of marries up. Um, obviously, Postacoglu on Monday told us that he expects Spurs to be changing for the title next season. Um, very clearly said that. He said, otherwise, what's the point in me being here? Um, Spurs obviously making these statements that they're going to uh, continue to invest in the squad and win top honours. Talking about new, you know, investment coming into the club as well. I'm intrigued to see how that moves now with the public kind of being in the public domain uh, and how quickly they now do find investment or whether it ends up just becoming a bit like the stadium naming rights and just a nice thing in the background. Also, I couldn't find anything as well about the remaining £50 million from Enoch. It was mentioned about the £100 million that was injected, but nothing seemed to be indicated about the, the remaining 50 So maybe that's just vanished into the ether and just isn't uh, part of it. Um, yeah, so we'll see. I mean, you know, Daniel Levy, I don't think you can definitely can't take away from the fact that the guy knows how to make money for a football club. Absolutely, he's one of the best in the world at doing that, making a revenue-generating club. But they're not a trophy-generating club. You know, one trophy in his entire 23 years or so is uh is not good enough and it's there's definitely you know the, i've seen lots of excuses kind of made for it but on the whole there's been so many crossroads moments when managers were almost there and just that little bit extra yes sometimes it was on the pitch but they were also sometimes off the pitch when a little bit more could have been done and it feels like we're about to approach one of those summers again it feels like this was a rebuilding year and then next summer is the one where Postacoglu expects them to push on to be a title contending team. And uh, again, all scrutiny and all eyes are on Daniel Levy, I guess, and, and how he b- 
backs the manager. God, how many summers have we said that in a row? It feels like the most. Every summer. <laughs> Every summer. And uh, yeah, if they could get some investment in before that, that would be a huge injection and boost to that. Yeah. I mean, you look at the Tottenham squad now and there's some real quality in there, some yeah. really, really good players, but just needs, you know, one or two more quality signings, top end signings. And then uh, you've got a manager who knows how to win things, plays good football. Uh, and I think Spurs are in a good position, just needs that bit more quality. And let's be honest, we don't know what Liverpool are going to be like next season yeah. without Klopp. You know, they could go the other way. Uh Spurs just need to somehow kick on and, you know, if someone wants to come in and invest in the club, then, you know, that might be it. That takes them those steps forward and helps them not only, you know, win trophies, but, you know, win them, you know, continuously. Because that's what look- Ange Postacoglu wants as well. Absolutely. Are you looking to invest some of your millions into the club? <laughs> I don't think I'll have enough to, uh, you know, invest. No. That's because you keep going on holidays. If you're still spending no. so much on these uh, worldwide holidays, <laughs> you, know, you should invest it in the club. I'll have to ask uh, Wilma about bonuses. <laughs> Daniel Levy's getting three million, then then we'll see about investing. Uh, do you know what? I knew you were going to turn Daniel <laughs> Levy's bonus into trying to get a bonus out of the boss. Um, yeah, we'll have to get him on the next show back on it. I think he enjoyed his little stint while you were away. So uh, apart from his coughing, do- have you heard about his poor coughing dog? Yeah, yeah, I've I've heard it before because oh. uh, we had a work meeting and the dog was poor dog was coughing. Yeah, I felt so. It was one of those where I felt so sorry, but I was laughing because of the fact that he's. I think he's. Was it Billy? I'm trying to remember his name of his dog now, and he's got he's gone steroids for this coughing problem, and I which I wasn't aware of, and I just thought it was a human coughing in the background, <laughs> and it was the most human sounding dog I've ever heard in my life. And yeah, our podcast pretty much kind of came to a close because neither of us could really continue. He couldn't hear properly. I was laughing too much. And you see, you bring this professionalism back with you. That's that's, that's certainly a benefit of uh, Rob Guest. Right. I think we'll leave that there uh, for today's podcast. Uh, We'll be back early next week to discuss the Nottingham Forest game. And then Nuno, the return of Nuno. Oh, that then, press conference. I'm excited about that minute and a half. <laughs> I really am. And then also looking ahead to uh, a trip to St. James's Park. Uh, yes. Hopefully won't be like the last visit uh, oh, 12 months ago. I forgot about that. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Right then, uh, as ever, thanks for listening to the podcast and just keep with us at football.london for all your latest Tottenham news. To get the best discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest. There's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee and you'll help support our podcast. The link is in the episode description box.